love your ring. It's beautiful. That's, <laughs> that's beautiful. What is that? An opal. It's gorgeous. It is just beautiful. Is that Cancer? No, opal that's the sign? sign of the Libra. Is that really? Oh, yeah. right, it is a Libra. Yeah, it's the sign of the Libra. That's right, it is. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The diamonds aren't bad either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to throw one away, just uh, throw in your in direction, my direction. Right? Right. I'm sitting here looking at you. You look so composed, so secure, so confident. Mm. Are you all these things? I don't think so. I'm a nervous wreck, I think, most of the time. Why? Uh, well, <clears throat> I just learned this year to stop shaking my leg when I did television. <laughs> I stopped twitching my hand. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I just am, I feel composed. I feel calm around you. I don't, I don't feel nervous or intimidated or anything like that. I feel calm. I don't feel funny. I think uh, you only get really nervous when you feel a little insecure. Do you find that things about yourself change? Do you notice changes about yourself now that I think you've arrived? Whether you think you've arrived, that's something else. Do I notice changes about myself? Well, <clears throat> I think I notice that I have more work to do. I, I look at everything, I'm a Capricorn, so I don't know if that means anything to you, but I look at everything kind of in terms of work and uh, whether I do it well or not well. And um, it becomes more work. My career, the better it gets, uh, the more recognition there is, I feel is more work. And so it's more sacrifice in the end. And uh, maybe some people look at, at their work as their hobbies and, and they don't mind giving up their freedom and they don't mind giving up all of the things that are personal to them. I mind, so it always is work, I think, at some point, even you, though it is fun. But Donna, if you mind, mm -hmm. what do you do with Because I love it. I'm a, I'm a masochist, I think. Is that what it's oh, all I about? I believe that the, uh, the industry is absolute masochism. And I know that sounds horrible, but please forgive me. <laughs> I believe that it is masochism. And I think that it's a love hatred that you never, never grow out of. And uh, very few people manage to achieve uh, a point in life where they don't care. And um, it's either a recognition of the fact that somewhere you've gotten a little bit more than someone else, or at least the ability to expose yourself um, and the talents that you do have and want to. Um, and uh, so you go for it. And there's that constant struggle back and forth of, uh, should I give it up? Should I hold on? And it beats you one week, and you beat it the next week. And, and it's just never ending. I can, I've been singing since I was six years old. And I can, re I mean, the, the heartbreak involved is alone enough to write mi a million songs about. Um, but I'm sure no more than anyone else's. Yeah. I want you to be as honest and as candid as mm -hmm. you can be. We both know mm -hmm. that the road to the top is not an easy one for mm -hmm. anyone. No. But my instincts tell me, Donna, that it's got to be a lot tougher for a black woman. Has it been <coughs> very tough for you? You know, Ron, I, I don't know if I can answer that honestly um, as a general question because I will, I have to say that I don't feel that I am indicative of every black woman and that I feel that my life has been quite an exception. I spent eight years in Europe, one, and um, was on, you know, was one of very, very few black women there and was very successful at what I was doing. And so coming back, I came back with a successful record so that it, it, it's very hard. It's not, I don't think it's a normal situation so that I could really say, uh, yes, it's, it's much tougher because but, I can't say that. But you said two things. One, you said there's a lot of heartbreak and you're quite sure everyone has had their heartbreak. But why did you leave this country to go to, make, to, go to Europe to make a name for yourself? Why didn't you tough it out here? Well, honestly. What was the reason behind it? I believe, well, I believe in past lives and I believe in things that you bring from other, under, other lifetimes and, and just heritage and so forth. And from, from the time that I was very little, I used to feel some type of affinity to Europe. Why? I don't know. I always wanted to go to Europe. And I had an opportunity on several occasions. My parents would let me go. And so I auditioned for hair in New York and I went to Europe. And that's how I got there. And when I got the chance to go, I, I had had a record contract right in my hand. I gave it up at that point. I didn't want to record. I wanted to go to Europe. So. Even then, when I was confronted with, you know, here's your dream, here's your record contract, I said, I think I'd rather see Europe. And that's why I really went to Europe, because I wanted to go. And uh, I felt like uh, watching the Supremes, 
Diana Ross and the Supremes when I was a little young girl, um, and seeing that uh, a lot of the times how hard they worked to get there and just how how much energy and time they had to put in it, into their careers. And knowing that I was 18 at the time, I wanted to live a little bit before I, I really decided to make that big a vow to something. Did you know, though, at 18, that you wanted to to be a singer, to be a performer, oh, well, to be a star? Right, but I was going to Europe to sing. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just a way of incorporating both of my desires in one package. So in other words, you really didn't feel the hand of prejudice at any time hitting you? I have to tell you that I think it's outlook and, and point of view and a lot of other things. I don't want to say that I have never felt the pains of prejudice around me or felt it myself. I have indeed. Um, however, I will say that I am not basically a prejudiced person. Therefore, I don't find prejudice in everything that someone does. I sometimes take it more personally, just that they don't like Donna. Not that they don't like me, because I'm black and I am also Donna. I am Donna first. And um, I've grown up pretty much with that attitude and I think that it's been an asset to me. Um, you know, I do acknowledge people uh, who have a different a approach and different attitude because they've sometimes, so I think you can cause things to happen to yourself. Who instilled that attitude in you? My parents, they to did. a great extent. Well, my mother raised um, two or three of the kids in our neighborhood, and uh, they, were, they were Italian, and their mother worked all the time, and they lived at the house, and I mean, it, it, my neighbor was very mixed, Orientals, blacks, whites. I mean, it was just a very, very mi mixed neighborhood at the time. And uh, we all played together. And I think one time I recall a kid calling me a nigger. And I was, I was just, imp I jumped him. I mean, I jumped off the steps and I jumped right on him and beat him up. And not only did I, but everybody in the whole neighborhood did. Because we didn't grow up on in that premise. And, uh, and I don't think that I really learned all of the ethnic words for uh, equivalent to nigger until I think a year and a half to two years ago. And that's the truth. Hmm. And, and how'd you uh, learn that? Just by being around people who use those words, and I would say, I wouldn't. I would be kind of a little bit intimidated to ask because I would say, well, they think they're going to think I'm crazy, but I didn't really know what a lot of words meant, and uh, now I do. I've, I've taken the time to find out all of the words, but uh, they're just words. Hmm. You recorded your very first song, um, "Love to Love You, Baby." It was a very, very sexy number, and very recently. You released a song that I think is absolutely sensational. Thank you. Jimmy Webb's MacArthur's Park, mm -hmm. which is really quite a romantic song. Absolutely. Where were you in your head when you recorded both those tunes? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, Love to Love You, Baby, of course, in a totally different place than M with MacArthur Park. Uh, with Love to Love You, it was... Um, Actually, I think in, in the studio itself, as the recording was actually taking place, I was thinking about Marilyn Monroe. And I was saying, well, how would she do this song? And um, that's the limit that I had to take it to. And I would say, well, she wouldn't, it wouldn't be a lot of words. She would be more cutesy with it. So I took it to that place. Um, I imagined myself as that type of person singing that song. Um, with, let's see, with... Uh, with MacArthur Park, it's a little different. I imagined a great love story and, uh, and sang the song as if it were a great love story. And uh, being in a great love story right now myself, as far as I'm concerned, um, I could relate to it. So I felt like I you know, was able to do it some kind of justice. Is your career affected by your personal life at any time? Oh, drastically, yes. <clears throat> to the better and to the worse, I think. If you're in love, in other words, oh. you're on a high, and if you're not oh, in love, not you're on a low. Oh, not necessarily. Sometimes when I'm on love, I'm more on a low. Hmm. I think that it's affected in many ways. Uh, when I'm on the road, for example, I don't go out very much, I, and I have bodyguards around me, and it's uh, it's very uh, closed-in, sheltered kind of living. And when I go out, it's I'm always intimidated by uh, people's reaction to me because I don't run around, just as I'm sure you don't, thinking I'm Ronna Barrett every day of the week or every time that you walk out of your house, you don't think who you are. You just go. And um, I'm confronted when people recognize me that, oh, yes, I, I have a career. And um, when my boyfriend and I are not together and there's no one to occupy my time, sometimes I, uh, I start getting very depressed because I'm alone all the time. 
and I start then wondering, I wonder what he's doing, you know, and so it goes, you know, it's just as normal as every other person in this world. It seems to me that you're paying a very heavy price for this stardom, and I want to know, is it really worth it? I feel at some point, I think, that I sacrificed not just for myself, but for my parents, uh, who gave me a lot, who never let me down, for my family, for my sisters, for the people that I love, and for the people that I want to see help, uh, what would like to help. Uh, to grow, and for my child, Mimi, and uh, just for people that I love. And, and sometimes uh, they don't understand because I can't be home, and they get a little bit shaky, but then I always I send them a ticket and make them come with me on the road for about two or three days. They've had enough after that. They understand everything. So um, at some point, you know, I guess that's the reason. I, I saw how my parents struggled when I was a child, and I just said, it's got to be a better way than this. What did they do, Donna? Well, my father was a butcher when I was very young, and my mother worked in a sneaker factory. And uh, for, I don't know, then she worked making curtains in a factory, and then my father progressed to a different job. I, I really don't know. Uh, then he was trained as an electrician. And, uh, and I, at some point, I would just see them struggling. My father do sometimes janitor work here and this thing here, and I would just want them to be home so much. And I, I just knew that when they had arguments, it was mostly about money, and that money was the root of all evil, but without it, you know, you wouldn't survive. And, and uh, so I figured it was, I took the initiative to go out and try to make it better for, for everybody, yes. What made you decide on taking a path into the world of entertainment as opposed to, let's say, becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist or going into any other profession that may or may not have been open to? I well, don't know. I think the need to be understood more than anything else. Like I said, my parents, were, my, my mother and father were great. Um, when I was 10 years old, I decided that there was something in me that I didn't understand and that because I didn't understand that it was very hard to make someone else understand what that was. What did you feel? I was very depressive and uh, I couldn't laugh about anything and I thought that was strange that when I, I would see kids playing, that when I would play with them, I would feel as though I was playing at playing, but I wasn't really having a good time. And I was depressed with something that was much heavier than myself. And uh, finding at some point the need to express that feeling to someone, I would just start singing. And I listened to Mahalia Jackson, and, and uh, I said, you know, she, somehow she has what I want. And I think I would just listen and listen for hours. My mother would, uh, my mother would sit, laugh at me at first, and she said, oh, you're not really serious about singing. And uh, my father would take me off to the side and teach me. And, Finally, it became a reality, and I sang in church, and I think I was 10 years old, and someone got sick, and they said, oh, well, we heard you practicing. Do you want to sing? And I said, I was scared, and I mm -hmm. sang. And I just recalled through a mass of, of, of tears opening my eyes and hearing this enormous voice at that point and not knowing where it came from, or if it even came out of me, and just feeling like in that, exactly at that moment that I was blessed and that nothing anyone could do out there could ever touch me. And uh, feeling very blessed. I just want, that's what happened, you know. You knew it right I then? I knew it right at that, sp at that spot in time. Do you think it was a religious experience you had at that moment? Um, I'm sure that it was at some point. But I'm sure that it was, the funny thing about it is that the, the song that I was, I was learning was called I Found the Answer. I learned to pray. And it was a, a gospel song. And, uh, and it just all seemed to take place, and it was sort of the evolution of having worked so hard because I wanted it so bad. I wanted to, to let people know that I wasn't to be laughed at, only I was to be taken seriously. And uh, Did you have a tough time trying to convince a lot of other people? Sang. Not after you sang. Once I sang, people took me seriously. And uh, it just became, that became my lever of getting the kind of respect that I think I needed. And I think that even as a child that it was probably a, a necessity for a type of mutual respect as opposed to being treated as, an, as a child without any individuality. And um, I was, you know, I wrote poetry when I was, since I've been a little, little, little kid and uh, I don't know. I have a feeling that it may have bothered you somewhere that after you gained your recognition because of your first song, that because you wanted to be so understood that you were terribly misunderstood. Oh, absolutely. Totally right. Absolutely. Um, then why did you do what you did? 
No, I didn't do it with that in mind. That's mean, the it, funny thing is, mm -hmm. is in Europe, I was living in a whole other structure. I lived in a structure and in a framework where uh, the discotheque is a place you go out every night. It wasn't even popular in America. There was no such thing as a disco song. Mm -hmm. We did songs, and uh, they played rock and roll songs and discos as well as any other kind of song. There was no categorization of disco. Um, I was just making a song, and I thought it was a, I really kind of took it as a, as a gag, and it was a gag that, that happened. So that really, that really wound up getting my foot in the door. So from that point on, I had to make it work for me because that was the recognition that I got. How did you know that you had to make it work for you? Some people would have fallen by the wayside and said, oh, this is not what I want. How could I have done I this to myself? I fell by the wayside <laughs> for did me. You? For you? Yes, I mean, for about, God, at least a year and a half, I was absolutely lost. I thought I was really bordering on a mental breakdown for a long time. And I, I didn't want to go out of the house. I didn't want to see anybody. I felt like people, when they interviewed me, would be nervous wrecks. They would think I was going to come out in a night, nightgown and jump on them. And I would say, but you don't understand, sexuality is not necessarily in clothes. It's not even in, in a person uh, optically. Uh, anybody can be very sexual. Any person or any, any, uh, any man, woman, child even. Um, it's a matter of what you have in your mind. And, um, and it was just sort of to prove a point, and I don't know, I, I, at some point it was terribly misunderstood, the reason why I did it in the first place. And we actually, we did it to, uh, my, my uh, producer, Georgia Moroda, came in one day, and it was kind of done as a threat. And he said to me, um, Jetem was on the market and it was selling. And I said, well, why should I buy someone else's Jetem? You know, let's make our own. And I, you know, did it in Mae Wessie, and, and then he, uh, he looked at me and he said, "You sexy," and at that till that point, I had had a very funny, comical reputation. I had won comedy awards, so I mean, it was very funny to everybody involved, but me, you know. And then when I went into the studio, I kept laughing. It was hysterical. And uh, at some point, I I said, "I got to take this seriously and just do it as if I were someone who were taking it seriously." And so I did it that way, and imagined myself with a man after a man that I was in, madly in love with after. He'd been away for a certain length of time. And that's how Love to Love You was sort of... Created? <clears throat> created, <laughs> yeah. It was a creation. And um, after having that image, it was like saying, if I had a plaid coat on um, and there was a yellow stripe in it, you're saying, well, that's a yellow coat. And I'm saying, no, I'm a coat of many colors. You're just seeing one stripe. So that was always the only way that I could explain it to people. And I would just say, well, I hope I get the chance to show you the other colors, that's all. So I worked at showing the other colors as much as I could without at the same time trying to lose the color that I had. So that it became kind of a touchy situation. It's very interesting. I think when people like myself and other people in the business, they develop these images of mm -hmm. another individual and most of the time Unless a person develops the reputation of being a spokesperson right. on a particular subject, one feels that somebody like yourself lives in a very small box. Right. Are you interested in other things oh, other God. than music? Really? I am probably this year going to open up in my own shop. I think I would like, I love to shop. I'm a shopaholic. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I really am. And I love to design things. And. Um, I think that this year I will open up my own merchandising uh, company and merchandise and help other people who are artistic. Uh, you know, it's another form of art. I, I really love to collect art and um, new artists. That are, I'm, I'm not familiar with a lot of American artists. I'm very familiar with a lot of European artists. And so I'm, I'm, I'll run from gallery to gallery just looking at paintings to, be, to become familiar. My, uh, one of my exes. Uh, when I came to America, I was a painter. So at one point in my life, I was extremely involved in art. Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of little hobbies. You know, I like and like I said, interior decorating, and and I <clears throat> I like I will start producing records this year, uh, which is another facet of my own business. Um, all kinds Are of things I want to learn to take my. I am inst interested in politics to some extent. Uh, when it affects my life at this point, I, I have been told by a number of astrologers that I at some point inevitably will go into politics. Why, I don't know. Why me, I say. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I've been asked 
uh, now that you mention it, uh, in Massachusetts to come down and speak to the, to the uh, state senate. Why? I don't know why they asked me what they did. That brings up another thing, though, Donna. When you become successful, there seems to me to be thousands of people who want to be your best friend. Yeah. Oh, God. Is it easy no. to separate the people who are there to, to get something from you mm -hmm. and those who truly love you for being Donna Summer? Well, it is and it isn't. It's really hard sometimes. You never know what evil lurks in the hearts of men. You are know? you suspicious of people? I'm not suspicious of certain people. My family, I am as good as never suspicious of. Uh, my manager, Susan Mineo, I love innately. Uh, her, her entire family, because we are very much alike, she loved me when I hit, th hit this ground when I first came into this country and has been that kind of a friend. Um, even the people at my record company, I have, you know, a very, uh, a very strong closeness to and a good feeling of trust. I believe that if there's a problem that we'll work it out. Um, the people that I was involved with when I first came to America who held my hand and let me know that it was okay and weren't just into pushing, 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 uh, I still have a very strong uh, affinity to and love for. And uh, there are people who have come and gone. There are people around me, but I, I don't have a lot of people around me. My butler and I are very good friends. I want to make him an actor. Um, my secretary, I would like to see her go into her own business, you know. So um, the people who are around me and are very close, I really sp spend a lot of time in finding ways that they will grow also. Because if I alone grow, it doesn't help anybody. It just causes dissension and jealousy. So if everyone is growing, they don't have a feeling of stagnation. And I think that that's only to my, to my aid. And I think that a lot of times the people that hook on to you are hoping that they'll grow and we'll be able to grow with you. And if those are the type of people that hook on to me, I don't think I ever really mind. What about the men who come into your life? I Not mean, really. now you're involved in a romance. Do you, are, you, are, you, are you able to find men on the same level as you are? I'm not saying necessarily financially, but at least emotionally, and do not have to be Mr. Donna Summer. Oh, well, um... Or is that not a problem? I, I... Well, it isn't for me. It might be for them. Uh, it's very hard, I think, you know, if you're in the business. You should know that. Not becoming someone, uh, not, well, let's say, not having someone with you who will become Mr. Donna Summer, uh, if there is such a thing. For me, I mean, I'm very capable of going home and washing the dishes, and I do. Uh, there are several things I do to keep myself on the ground, um, not to get you know, I'm, I'm here I am, Queen of Sheba, I'm living high off the hog. I always keep, it, you know, in, in consideration that at any point uh, I could lose everything that I, that I in this world possess. Do and, you possess uh, a lot? I don't think I possess that much, really. I, you know, I own a few things, but uh, I like to, well, I don't know. If you to talk to my accountants. <laughs> Now, Donna, if you were to lose your worldly goods, the things that you can touch, your houses, your furniture, whatever other things you might possess, mm -hmm. would it bother you? I'm sure that it would affect me, but I don't know if it would really in my soul bother me because I find that one, one habit that I've had since I was a child was that I never wanted to be possessive of, I, would, I never wanted to be possessed by things. I have a lot of things around me. I collect antiques like... I'm a mad woman, you know, I really am. I just get apartments just so I can furnish them with antiques. I don't even have anybody to stay in them, you know, but I just, you know, that's my little tick. Um, I like beautiful things, but at the same time, I can appreciate them even if they're not mine. So that the need to have them or the necessity to have them and say, this is mine, isn't really that strong. Uh, when I die, I can't take it with me. So wherever it is, if I should go to your house and see something that I admire as I admire the pin on your neck, um, I can still love it as much from afar looking at it. As a matter of fact, I have more from it being able to see it from afar than if it were on my own neck. I want to ask you this question, and if you feel that you can't answer it, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you, you may say I can't. Why? Do you select men who basically are white? 
I really How, couldn't I mean, answer. I, I have fallen them. I have, in Europe, I went with a guy who was black, and before that, I think that it's a matter of chemistry, and I can't, I mean, I have fallen in love with guys at the wrong time who were black and who are black, and it has not been the right moment. Um, it's very hard, I think, um, for some people to accept that there are sometimes just basic chemistry things that I have nothing against black men or white men. I just fall in love with whoever it is. It's also exposure, you know, I mean, um, a lot of guys that I see that I would love to go out with are married, you know, and um, it's just not a possibility uh, that are on, that are on, let's say, a compatible level at this point. Or even guys who, who are writers or whatever who would be someone that I would be interested in. Uh, at some point, it's a matter of interests, you know, and, and having been exposed sometimes to a lot of things outside of America, uh, my interests are not, are very varied. And uh, it's a matter of interest, really. I think more than anything else, it's a matter of compatibility. And uh, I really don't look at it on a black and white level. And I, 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 I think people tend to believe that. I don't at all. I, I can understand it from your point of view. I really can. I don't. I, I don't have a preference. I just, I like to look at a handsome man if there's one. And it doesn't matter to me, you know. And if that hap handsome man happens to be available on I2, and that happens, then that happens. I have no nothing against that. And but uh, with my sedination really not being totally acceptable to a whole world and a way of life, what do you want for Mimi? For Mimi? I want her to be independent of money. Hmm. I think more than anything else, um, I never want money to become a vice for her. I want her to know people. So I gear her in a people-oriented world. Uh, I would like her to become, if anything, an active person as far as people are concerned, um, doing people things, and not doing things where she uh, is living just as a jet setter on whatever money she's gotten from her family. I want her to earn what she has, and I want her to be very independent. And I want her to, to, uh, I want her to, to utilize her talents and her abilities uh, for mankind, for whatever they are. Uh, she's a, a remarkable character. I'm Would you like her, though, Donna? Would you like your daughter to follow in your footsteps? Would you have any objection if None she decided all. she wanted to be a performer? None at all. I think she already has. She's been on stage with me on several occasions. And uh, it frightens her still. Uh, but at some point, it's very good for her to understand what I go through so that she can understand when I tell her I need space to be alone, why I, why I say things like that. Um, I just hope that Mimi is a good person. I, I, I guess every parent hopes for the same. And it might sound too simple for someone like me to say that, but I, I don't care if she doesn't care about anything that's worldly. I don't care. What did having her, though, mean for you? Changed my life. Did it happen? She was, she's the best thing that ever happened to my life. I decided with Mimi, um, I mean, there's a series of things that were involved with Mimi. I wasn't married. My husband was Austrian. I couldn't get my you know, uh, birth certificates in, and for some reason they kept getting messed up, and, and uh, I was seven months pregnant by the time they came, got married. Uh, Mimi is definitely a child of love. I mean, uh, she, I don't think she ever cried more than, God, three, 30 seconds from the time that she was little. And she cries more now than she ever cried, and she never cried as a child. I used to take her to the doctor because I thought she was ill. And, uh, with Mimi came a lot of decisions in my life that I, I was responsible for someone other than myself. And that responsibility took preference to anything that I wanted. And uh, the fact that I had to provide for her and the fact that my marriage at some point didn't, wasn't really working. Um, and knowing that I, wouldn't rel I would not rely on my husband to take that responsibility, that I could only be accepted. Um, I did, and I allowed my husband to go on and go to school, and uh, he's still studying, as a matter of fact. And I mean, he was studying before he became an actor, and then he went into acting, and he dropped out of college, and now he's gone back to college in the last two years, and uh, is finishing up whatever he's, you know, doing. And uh, we're very, very good friends. And um, I don't know. Uh, what should I say? It's. Um, I was going to say to you though, if. 
having been brought up with obviously in, in, a, in an atmosphere where you had a mother and father yeah. and they stayed together, is getting a divorce a difficult thing? Oh, it was, I think for one year before I was divorced that I, I went through a, a manner of manic depression that I would never wish on my worst enemy. I used to pass out on the street. Why? What happened? A feeling of guilt that I was not used to having. Um, feeling of, of, of giving up. The feeling of letting go of something that I don't, didn't know for sure wouldn't work. But feeling that I couldn't go on. A feeling that uh, my life was changing and I couldn't stop it. Um, a feeling that I was maybe hurting someone's life also because my husband became very uh, into what my life was at that point. And no matter, uh, you know, I wasn't even successful on a large scale at that point in my life, more sort of centered around Germany and, and Austri Austria, but uh, everything was put into me, the energy. He worked so that he could give everything to me, and it was just very strange because he never let me down to be the one to have to say, I'm leaving. And uh, the guilt of that was so strong. And it's, I don't think I've ever gotten over it. I think that I still have a very strong feeling of guilt towards my husband. Do you uh, think that guilt, I, I hear this in the back of my head, the word guilt, you don't say it actually, but do you think, do you feel guilty because you were chosen to be one of the select few to sort of rise above others, to become a very successful person in a world where most people aren't? or attain the success that you've attained? Uh, yes and no. Yes, at some point, you know, I, I try to make myself understand that. I say, well, you know, God chose you to be special, and it's your obligation to your talent to do whatever you can do, and never forget that you're a human being, firstly. Um, but at the same time, when it involves other people's lives, it becomes such a heavy thing. It's a weight. It's I'm taking my daughter's father away. Um, it was so much heavier than that, you know, it was, I, it's hard to explain. I'm in a world, and a world that's German, transposed into a whole other surrounding, into a whole other mentality has, that doesn't deal with divorce like we deal with divorce. Um, so I went through a lot of changes, you know, and the divorce was definitely a, a serious and a heavy one for me. And, and yet my husband was, he was more than more than a gentleman, more than fair, more than everything. I mean, he's wonderful. I love him. Hmm. You know. I know that you're into astrology. Yes, I am. <laughs> what have the astrologers predicted for you in 1979 and for your future? Well, my astrologers have predicted and don't be modest a number of things. I, well, it is and it isn't. Like I told you, it's work is what it is. Uh, they predicted a lot of incredible things. Um, they told me that I would be far richer than I ever, ever dreamed of being, not only through my profession, but through other ventures. Um, they also have gu guided, if that's the right word in English, um, my manager and I together uh, in going in different ventures with each other uh, outside of what would, you know, just her managing me, we've taken on uh, a management company and um, Susan Mineo and I, and uh, just developing different people and their talents, and I would, I would be there to see them grow. Uh, she told me that Mimi would be very, very famous. Um, lots of things. Uh, let me see. Mimi. One told me to invest in an emerald mine. All the things that they've predicted for you, both positive and maybe slightly negative. Do you want them all to happen? If you could draw your own map for your own life, would you want it the way they say it's going to turn out to be? Or would you change things? I would not go into politics if I could help it. Why not? Because I don't think it's a clean business. And I wonder if it's really possible that a human being with any form of morality or moral sense can really, really, really be involved in a business that is dirty and was established on dirty grounds and on unfair grounds. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think that would be the one thing that I would change, and that's the one thing that everybody keeps drawing this conclusion, and I, it's such a fatal business. And I say a business. It's not a profession to me. It's really a, it's a rat race. It's well, a how business. would you evaluate the music business? 
Oh, as as well, it, but at least it's not governing in some way uh, the country. It's uh, on a different level, yes. Um, but don't you think, having experienced what you are experiencing now in a business that basically is so tough, can be so cruel, does some pull some of the dirtiest tricks that any oh, of us ever know? Absolutely. Or knew? Really? That maybe this is. You know, you're building the foundation. <laughs> I, I, would, I would tend to think that if I highly criticize other uh, politicians or politicians in general, not saying that they're dirty, only saying that they are involved in a business that is not a clean one and cannot be. I mean, it's impossible for politics to be uh, a clean business because there are so many counter things going on. I mean, you should tell this guy yes, but you know that if you told him no, that they would sell out, and they, you cannot afford to, for them to sell out until you know whether or not you have X, you know? I mean, so it's a whole thing of, of, of bargaining back and forth and, and making it work for a whole, a multitude of people. Um, I don't, I'm not really putting that down because it is the business that it is, but it is a business that is um, vulnerable to criticism. And uh, if I could not perceive of a method that would work, that was not following the same path that politics has, has followed till now, I don't think I would want to be involved in it. And I think that I, I wouldn't have the strength to hold up under the pressure of what exists. But when you sing, do you not manipulate them? Oh, I, but that's maybe my only way to manipulate in a good way, if, I, if it is a good way. And that's been criticized too, you know. But, uh, I mean, you can't please the world. You can only do what you hope to do. And uh, I don't know. I just try my best. But I, I, if there were anything that I could change, getting back to the astrology, that's what I would change. Thank you. Okay.